Well, anytime you watch Michael play, uh, certainly uh, you think back to that time a little bit. Coach Harbin, of course, uh, was the head coach of that team, and uh, Bob Chipman and myself were the uh, other coaches on that staff. So I had Michael in uh, the camp uh, in selecting the team, and of course he was a terrific player even at that time. He was a young college player, but uh, you could tell how how good he was, and uh, that team went on to win the gold, and Caracas finished the weightless. So uh, good memories. Yeah, you say he was good at that time. Did you know he was that good? Did you have any inkling that he was going to be the superstar he turned out to be? Yeah, of course, I don't know that you could have projected uh, to be that good because he's one of the best, if not the best ever. But, uh, yeah, in, in drills, I remember a uh, defensive drill where you're playing one-on-one from the wing and uh, he's on defense and the guy with the ball had no chance to go forward at all, <laughs> let alone go score. So, uh he uh, was a terrific offensive player, but also uh, equally good on the defensive end. I'm talking right now with Lon Kruger. What was he like as a, as a guy? It seemed like just from watching the documentary at that time, he was far more laid back, obviously, than he was once he became the superstar he was. What do you remember about just his demeanor and how he how he acted? He was uh, you know, obviously very confident, uh, very much in control. Uh, you know, The court was his, uh, even as a young player. Uh, you know, he wasn't uh, brash. He wasn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, out of line at all. But he was definitely the leader. He was the guy that set the tone. He was the guy that uh, controlled the practices. He was the guy that uh, de- determined what was going on. So, uh, but again, I guess all that's not surprising when you look back now to to see what he's done through his career. Is there anything you remember that he did, like in a game when you guys actually were there at the Pan Am Games and went eight and zero? Probably one thing I remember about him, uh, and not related to the game necessarily, but we went in to, to the um, the residence halls, uh, and they weren't quite finished. Quite frankly, they is one of those cases where they built you know built everything up, trying to get it done in time for the Pan American Games, and and they just didn't quite get it done. And we walked in; it was almost like uh, the work windows on the building. There, you know, the doors were half of them were up, and. And so now we're deciding, do we ask these guys to stay here uh, or do we take them to a hotel? And, and uh, you know, Coach Harvin kind of threw it out there. And, and Michael was quick to step up and say, hey, Coach, you know, this is fine. We're here to play basketball. Let's go. And uh, so none of the other players said, said anything. Because they could have well complained about the, the facility because it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't ready. But, uh, but Michael stepped up and set the tone and uh, everyone else stepped right in line. Lon Kruger talking with me here. I, I, as someone who lives here in Manhattan and has now for a while, I, I am curious if you can remember what was when you guys were actually practicing here in Manhattan. Like I see the picture, the team picture of you guys in a hern. How how long was Michael in Manhattan, and what was the setup while you guys were here? Yeah, you know, I, I don't remember specifics. I do remember practicing there. Uh, brought uh, you know, the, we went to Colorado uh, Springs to select the team. And uh, then we, uh, you know, before we left for the trip, we brought him into Manhattan for uh, I would imagine the week. I don't I don't recall exactly, but uh, that was typically what we did during those times. And then I know we uh, traveled to Puerto Rico on the way down, and maybe even Dominican Islands, uh, Dominican uh, Republic, uh, on the way to Caracas. So uh, uh, it was probably probably a week of, of practice in Manhattan. Well, Lon, you need to educate me here. I'm 30 years old. I never got a chance to actually see a game in a Hearn. I don't know a whole lot about Jack Hartman other than I can look at the list of accomplishments of what he did. What what was Jack Hartman? Let's start there. What was Jack Hartman like as a coach? What would you tell me, somebody who never got a chance to see him? Well, he, he was a terrific coach. Uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, very deserving to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, hopefully he'll get there one day. Uh, he's a guy that's very organized, uh, got the most out of his teams. Uh, individually, he, he put people in position where they could be effective. Uh, you know, just very disciplined defensively. Uh, you know, guys knew exactly what what he wanted. Uh, again, just highly, highly respected by uh, his peers. You know, people that coached against him, and uh, and obviously won a lot of ball games. Did a great job. And then a Hearn. You've been in Bramlage when it's rocking. You've been in a Hearn when it's rocking. Uh, how how do they compare? What was it like playing in a Hearn? Anyway, I've got obviously a soft spot uh, back. You know, played there as a player in the uh, early seventies. Been coached there in uh, you know uh, late eighties before moving to Bramley. So, uh, Hearn was special. Uh, Hearn was special, but it was special because of the people. You know, the fans were great. The students were great. 
They lined up early. They camped out overnight. They did all those things that make for great uh, crowds, great atmosphere, and and they earned was uh, as good as they come. You know, they uh, you know you, you look at the great crowds in the country, and uh, they earned was one of the one of the best without any question. You remember what the loudest was you ever heard it? I tell you what, a lot of people refer to. Um, I think it was seventy five, seventy six, when we had the. Uh, I think it was the uh, Soviet and Yugoslav national team, you know, came in. It wasn't a full Ahern, but it was a great crowd. The national, you know, the sense of nationality came through. And uh, then, of course, you've got all the rivalry games uh, that uh, pretty hard to one, one to top the next because they were all outstanding. Just a great atmosphere. Well, Lon, before I let you go, you know, I always look back and I – I see people will map out the stats of where the two programs went, K-State and Kansas, after that 1988 game in the Elite Eight. How often do you still look back and think about that game? Is that one that sticks with you all these years later? It does, uh, because uh, you know, we'd beaten uh, we'd beaten KU uh, three weeks earlier in the conference tournament, and, and KU, was, you know, they kind of played that game as if their season was over. And then, of course, Danny Manning got it going, and, and they had it. Magical run through um, through the NCAA tournament to the championship, but uh, move the Elite Eight game. Yeah, we uh, we uh, you know were right there with the chance to to go to the Final Four. Didn't get it done, and and uh, KU did, and turned it into a national championship. So uh, think about that often. But uh, you know, it was a great great season on both both fronts. But KU extended theirs a little bit longer. Well, Lon, really appreciate you taking some time uh, for me today. Best of luck navigating what's a tricky time for everybody right now, and uh, take care. Appreciate it, John. Thanks very much. Hey, John.